Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. It is our great privilege to have with us this evening Mr. Grant Palmer. He is a uh, retired member of the LDS Church Education System. He has been an LDS Institute director and number, held a number of other posts in a 34-year career there. Um, he is also the author of an insider's view of LDS origins, excuse me, Mormon origins. Uh, it is a privilege to have him with us, Mr. Palmer, great to have you. Thank you. When I go to the LDS Apologetics website fair, and I look at their review of your book, I see that they seem to take great exception to you calling yourself uh, an insider. Now, I can understand them being upset about my, me calling myself an insider. I've never been a Latter-day Saint, but what do you think qualifies you as an insider? Well, I suppose it depends how you uh, define the word. And, uh, you know, if you want to get really technical and, and define it narrowly, then maybe I'm not. But I would say I am. I'm four to six generations uh, uh, on all sides. Uh, my great uncle, Charles H. Hart, was a was a general authority, first quorum of 70. Uh, I grew up with a number of uh, apostles and knew some of the presidents of the church. They were in my home. My parents were friends with them. But the 34 years teaching uh, uh, mainly LDS Institute uh, classes, I've, I feel um, qualifies me to be called an insider. I, I agree. I think it's ridiculous to to challenge that. I mean, I mean, I, who do they consider to be an insider if not someone like yourself? I mean, you have to be a general authority to be an insider? Do you actually have to come, to have lived during Joseph Smith's time or what? But uh, tell us a little bit. Now, you, you say that you're multi-generation LDS. Your, your ancestors go back to the pioneers. Uh, you grew up in the LDS church. You served your mission? Yes. Yes, I uh, served the LDS mission in uh, Virginia, North Carolina. In 1962, our mission led the world in convert baptisms and uh, for the LDS Church, and I was very much a part of that. From there, is that what led you into the church education system? Yes, I was so imbued with uh, the spirit of, uh, of uh, missionary work that I, uh, I wanted to do it for a living, and I did. So you believe that you had a, a, a solid testimony Oh, uh, very much so, yes. So what kind of work did you do uh, in the church education system? Well, I started out in uh, the Church College of New Zealand, and I, I really was hired to go over there to teach British Empire history and to high school students, and, uh, and then uh, taught some, a class or two of junior high science. And then when one of the religion teachers went home, I, I kind of moved into his position. And from there, I was hired into the institute program of the LDS Church. So you've taught in institute classes? Oh, well, mainly. I've been an institute director, you know, three different times in my 34 years. Uh, I did have, uh, I did come to Salt Lake because my uh, wife's mother was ill, and I did take a seminary position for about uh, seven, seven and a half, eight years. And I became a much better teacher when you have to teach high school kids <laughs> than teaching university students. So you, you've, you've served a range of, of, of callings in the, LD, in the LDS church education system. Yes, I would say so. Uh, institute director, seminary coordinator, uh, 
uh, LDS chaplain, uh, uh, at least those those three callings. You've also had callings within your, your local ward, haven't you? Yes, I was uh, on the high council. I was elders quorum president, Sunday school president, young men's president, uh, gospel doctrine teacher, temple officiator. Uh, done a good deal of it. Now, about the time that you came back to Salt Lake, uh, that was about the same time that the Mark Hoffman things were going on, wasn't it? Well, I came back in... Uh, in 1980 and about 1984 is when the Hoffman letters began to circulate and so forth. Now that piqued your interest as someone who had been studying uh, LDS history. Yet, didn't it? Well it did. Uh, you know I knew about uh, several of the uh, uh, that Joseph Smith had seen something like a salamander or something like a toad. There's several references to that. And one of the senior historians at BYU was asked to, uh, to help uh, Mark Christensen at the time, who had bought and purchased the uh, Phelps Harris Salamander letter, to do research on it. And he'd come across this, uh, this uh, short story, I guess you could call, uh, call it, uh, called the E.T.A. Hoffman's The Golden Pot. And he said to me, he says, Grant, uh, he says, I've read this. Uh, would you read it and let's get together and have a discussion about about what what is found and so he did that but I read the piece seven times and he says well did you see all these parallels to the Joseph Smith story and I says yes but there's a lot more there and uh, and uh, it, it just surprised me and and we've really never had an adequate explanation as to where the angel gold plate story of Joseph Smith may have come from uh, it could be his own experience, or it could be uh, certainly treasure lore as part of that story. Uh, I personally am not sure we, we know exactly what happened, but this story of the golden pot uh, has very similar kinds of uh, identifiable things that Joseph Smith talked about. For example, he, uh, the young man in this story is, is a theological student called of God, and yet he's, uh, uh, his lo ordinary life is quite boring, and so he gets off into these, these fantasy uh, spells, and uh, he has a dream three times in one night that he's going to, to enc encounter an ancient being, an, a, an ancient archivist, and he will be able to translate the record of the Atlanteans. And... Uh, but he can't do it for monetary reasons, he can't do it uh, for selfish reasons, and so he eventually passes the test and gets the record and translates it. Um, what intrigued me about that story is that this young man, his name is Anselmus in the story, he, he dreams about it three times in one night. Now to a treasure adept, that means you're going to get the record, the treasure. You go up to mm -hmm. Vermont. Uh, what intrigued me was the next morning he has a fourth vision and it's uh, under, a, under a, an elder tree and uh, he encounters this being again just like Joseph Smith. What intrigued me was in this story, The Golden Pot, it's all done in a dream. The three in one evening and then the f next day still in a dream he uh, he encounters uh, this archivist in the form of a salamander, who rises up and and beats him up basically. Well, that, that's kind of what Joseph Smith. So the thought occurred to me: I wonder if if he, he's using that story. Uh, it, it was in the environment. We think we may have known who introduced it but we're, we're not certain. But no one has ever explained where this story that Joseph Smith tells c came from. Is it is his own experience or is it the folklore that was in his environment? Was this story influencing him? And I don't know that we know the, the full answer to that. But, I, but what I would say is that I think that, that when Joseph Smith talks about dreaming three times in one night and then he wakes up from the dreams and then 
or visitations, I think they later became. Then he went to the hill, and then he's, he encounters something like a toad, and it comes into a scary old man and beats the living daylights out of him. And to me, those kind of things happened in dreams. They don't happen in reality. So let, let's go back now. The, the Hoffman letter was actually a forgery. It but, was. But what was the gist of the story there? I mean, it was Martin Harris and Phelps corresponding and Martin Harris communicating to Phelps supposedly what had happened to Joseph? Correct. And these kinds of mystical uh, yes. spins on things. With, well, with something like a toad, uh, I forget the exact wording in the salamander letter, something like a salamander or okay. a salamander appeared, changed into a form, and and abused, physically abused, Joseph Smith. So when this letter arises, it seems to set off a couple of different things in motion. One is people start researching and they find that there are other accounts yes. uh, that c correspond to this kind of mystical, magical view of things that's clearly within LDS um, sphere of things. Yes, and, one, and once it was shown to be a forgery, the Salamander letter, the senior historian I mentioned earlier, we just dropped that and went on because we had three or four other, uh, something like a toad and so forth. In fact, Michael Quinn found one that had been, uh, he had interviewed uh, the Saunders, which were Joseph Smith's uh, parents' friends, mm -hmm. and uh, he'd he was very open about it. He, they, they thought a lot of the Smiths had no axe to grind. And, he, and, Joseph, and this Benjamin Saunders says, Joseph told my mother and me while we were in the kitchen that something like a, a toad had raised up and beat the heck out of him, uh, some transmogrified being. And so Mar or, uh, Michael Quinn had found that reference once we started looking, and I had found one in even later that that appeared in the New York, uh, one of the New York papers, and Quinn and I swapped each those. So we had those two, plus we had Willard Chase's uh, Something Like a Toad, and we had a lot of references by Emma's cousins, the Lewises, in, uh, out, of, um, out of Harmony, Pennsylvania. So we had a, a, a quite a few references to this. So, so you've got this, this line of evidence for this kind of thinking within LDS circles, but what you were referring to earlier was actually from E.T.A. Hoffman's uh, story, The Golden Pot, in terms of what might have influenced. Yeah, I, I think it thing. had an influence, and see, no one's ever, ever, uh, I, I put that chapter in my insider's view of Mormon origins, not so much to prove a point, but to make a point. No one had ever outlined exactly. I, I find a lot of chronological parallels. I think I'm maybe 20 or 30 story items and uh, of course Joseph gets his golden plates on the fall equinox and so does Anselmus he gets these ancient records on the fall equinox and there's just a, a number of of, uh, of motifs that uh, chronologically uh, seem to fit now some people will agree that they're there and some say well it's not as strong as it could or should be uh, I think there's something to it, and so did the senior historian from BYU. We think there's something there. But I think he's influenced by whatever happened to him, himself, plus the treasure lore of the day, plus perhaps this short story. Now let's back up a little bit. These are some of the questions that get raised in terms of uh, having doubts about Joseph Smith being what the, the, the church puts forward now in, in the modern histories. Mm. When did the issue start getting raised for you that maybe what was being presented, I mean, you know, like the, the pictures that are put in the ensign of Joseph Smith with the plates and, tra and translating, things like that, you found that that wasn't actually what the contemporaries were seeing at all, was it? No, in fact, we've got about 22 statements from scribes, relatives, passerbys, and it's always a stone in the hat, no plates are around. It's his his uh, relatives, uh, his own family, Emma's parents. We do not have any primary references that said that he ever used the, the golden plates, ever. Now there are, 
so you've got this picture of Joseph Smith taking a hat, putting stones in the hat, and pulling the hat up up to his face, and supposedly mystically the uh, translation appears. The plates actually weren't even present. Were no, they? no, they they all said that they knew. His own father said they were out in the the woods, or they were they were hidden in a uh, uh, sugar sack, or they were out in the woods, or uh, the angel had them under custody. I mean, they were on the mantle, the fireplace. His own wife said, but no, no one ever uh, saw him using them. Now, there's another event that took place prior to to Hoffman sort of piquing your interest in some of these Mormon origins. Uh, you grew up during the time that the church recovered the papyri for uh, the Book of Abraham, didn't you? During, yes. During that time. Yes, 1967-68. Uh, there was a huge build-up. Cover story in the what was then the Improvement Era. Yes. Pictures of the papyri, uh, a, a, a year-long series of articles, uh, that didn't go anywhere. No, in fact, uh, Hugh Nibley, who did the articles, said he was just stalling for time so he could uh, learn Egyptian, so he could translate uh, the papyri, and uh, I think he went back to the Oriental Institute of Chicago and studied with Klaus Baer and maybe some others, Parker, Wilson, I don't know. Um, and then he basically came out and says, well, it's an Egyptian endowment, it doesn't has nothing to do with Abraham, and basically, skirted the issue. Uh, you've had Charles Larson on your program, I believe, and he mm -hmm. takes a little different approach to the Book of Abraham than I do, and his is certainly legitimate. Uh, he, he, he talks about, look, there's no Egyptologist who, who uh, supports what Joseph Smith has, has done, and then he gets into the Egyptian alphabet and grammar. I take a little different approach, and I says, well, in my book, chapter one, I say, well, where did he get the material in? And I think we can account for 100% of all the ideas that are in the book of Abraham from, from five different sources. And if you, uh, um, you, you get a lot of spin on this from uh, people that are on the payroll of the church, especially at BYU, but... Uh, I, th I think we can, chapter one, which is Abraham's story, where he, he goes into Egypt and then uh, his life is uh, going to be taken by the Pharaoh and then he teaches him astronomy and then he sits on the throne as facsimile three shows in the Pearly Great Prize. Uh, that's right out of Josephus, I do believe. And uh, Joseph Smith's family owned an 1830 copy of Josephus. I think that's where he's getting chapter one. Uh, chapters two, four, and five are, are the use of a King James Bible in a, a 1769 edition or later printing. And it contains 86% of those three chapters, chapter two, four, and five of the book of Abraham. There's only five chapters. And 86% uh, of that comes right out of the King James Bible, including the errors in that particular edition. So we know where he's getting the material. Um, that leaves chapter 3, which is astronomy. And J Joseph Smith, uh, I think he got a lot of that material from Thomas Dick's philosophy of a future state. The Smith, Joseph Smith owned a copy of that book, an 1830 edition. Uh, Oliver Cowdery writes about it in the then ensign uh, um, called The Messenger and Advocate. But the point is, no matter how you spin this thing, you can take those three facsimiles, uh, and Joseph Smith paid $2,400 for this material when they were building the Kirtland Temple. That's the equivalent of $61,000 in today's uh, money. It's a lot of money. Yeah. And yet, the apologists would say, well, he, he just had it by revelation. But the point I think that they need to address is no matter how Joseph Smith received his interpretations of facsimile one, two, or three, and fill in how you want him to do it, mm -hmm. he's wrong. You begin to see these various things. You're working in the church education system. 
did um, you just cease to believe it one, I mean, at, at some point years ago? Oh, you, you put you, things on the proverbial shelf and then you, you know, you do some more research because you, you love what you're doing and you prepare lessons and you find things and I guess it was just a slow build up over the years, but uh, yeah, facsimile th two, which is that hyphocephalus in the, in the Pearl Great Price, uh, Thomas Taylor's uh, 1816 book called The Six Books of Proclus on the Theology of Plato, there's four or five or six phrases that are exactly the same or almost exactly the same that are right in the explanation of that facsimile. So I, I don't know. In other words, these are all 19th century sources and the, and the astronomy is Newtonian. It is not, uh, it is not uh, correct. You could ask any BYU physicist. They will not defend it. Uh, Einstein's uh, structure of the universe is, is, is what is held sway and this is a Newtonian science and it's been thoroughly discredited. You still wanted to believe though, didn't you? Oh, very much so, yes. In fact, I, I went to a lot of BYU professors that I knew who are historians and they almost all would say, yes, we have problems and uh, we don't have very good answers and so forth and so on. Um, I talked to a lot of them. You finally came to a point where you had to go to your boss and ask to serve in a different function. I asked to go to the Salt Lake County Jail uh, because I, I just, I was so troubled by all of this that I asked to go. He knew what my problems were and uh, at the jail I was to teach only biblical materials and that worked fine with me and I thought well I'll, I'll just uh, continue my research and not be so frustrated and having to stand up in a uh, classroom and teach things that I I had problems with yeah so they knew about it and I've been really maligned on that one but that's the truth and you essentially reached a point where you retired early I retired retired four years early Exactly right, yes. And uh, now the spin that we hear from a lot of folks is that the only reason anyone would write anything critical of the LDS Church is for money or because they're embittered people. Well, I'm uh, certainly you, not embittered. I, I just think that only the truth's good enough for Latter-day Saints. And uh, uh, I've offered to make changes if they could show me where I was wrong and no one's ever stepped forward. Uh, I, I think truth is important. It seems as, as if most of your critics are more concerned with trying to attack you personally than the content. Well, that's certainly the case. Uh, f uh, Farms and Fair, I think they had seven or eight articles on me, and they spilled as much ink as is in that book right there that, uh, in Insider's View. And it took them a year to do it, so I got two of our very best historians, and I says, look, they've spent a year working on this. I want you to, to independently read and critique that, and if there's anything in there you think that is valid, I'd like to know about it, and the next edition will change it. They both came back to me, and these are really top flight historians, they're, they're, and, and they both says, you know, there's really nothing there on the surface, there's one or two items, but when you get a little deeper into it, they're wrong. I want to go ahead and open up our phone lines. If you'd like to join in the conversation, we have with us Grant Palmer. He is retired Institute of Religion Director from the uh, LDS Church. He is the author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Our phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. I think it's important, I mean, I, we've been talking around things that make great sense to me because I've read the book. But it seems as if you've got two basic things going on. One is you've got sort of a popular history of the LDS Church mm -hmm. that you know, Joseph Smith goes into the grove to pray. He, you know, very set, very clear chronology, very clear uh, visions, all these various things. You begin to find out that's not so neat. 
And then as you begin to question, then you begin to see that Joseph Smith actually could have written the Book of Mormon. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the first and on the second. We have a lot of folks that believe that it had to be, uh, it had to be Solomon Spalding, it had to be, um, oh my mind just went, who was the? Sidney uh, Rigdon. Sidney Rigdon. Uh, it had to be someone other than Joseph No, I Smith. think he's very capable. And the Book of Abraham leads a trail directly to the Book of Mormon. And if we had time this evening, we could talk about where each section of the Book of Mormon came from. But one of the things that motivated me to write is when I was doing my PhD in colonial history and American history at BYU, I did a lot of work in the Second Great Awakening, and I was utterly amazed that uh, the 11 preachers in the Book of Mormon, starting with uh, Jacob and Enos, clear up through Alma II, that's a good chunk of the Book of Mormon, they were Second Great Awakening speakers. They, Joseph says he went to these revivals as often as he could. He inclined towards the Methodist. You see Methodist doctrine, approach, style, conversion patterns. Uh, it, it just knocked me over. I, I was absolutely shocked at uh, how similar all of that was. And that's just one section of the Book of Mormon. I put that in chapter 4 here. But the King James Bible is probably represents 25% of the Book of Mormon. A lot of Mormons aren't aware of that because they don't know the Bible that well. But I'd say 25% for the Book of Mormon, or the, from the Bible. Another 25% from uh, evangelical Protestantism, mainly Methodist. And that's 50%. And then another uh, three influences would account for another 25%. So 75% of the book came right out of his backyard, and I think it's clearly a 19th century work. But don't take my word for it. Go ahead and do your own research. Uh, Smith family biographies in there, uh, anti-Masonic stuff, which has filled the election of 1828 with Andrew Jackson, who was a Mason, and the newspapers were filled with what will happen if a Mason gets in the executive branch of government, what will he do there and to the courts? And you see those themes running through uh, Third Nephi and Helaman. Uh, the war chapters are another matter, but anyway, suffice it to say that 75%, I think, we can make a pretty cogent case that it came right out of Joseph Smith's environment, and he's very capable. The things that he knew about is what appears in the Book of Mormon. It's striking to me as a Presbyterian that if you understand 19th century Presbyterianism, you see this attack over and over in various forms. I forget the group that, that builds the high platform, uh, mm. which is basically a high pulpit. Yes. Which you would have had in a congregational or Presbyterian church. And you know the attacks on the paid, uh, on, on paying pastors who work full time mm -hmm. to actually <coughs> put food on their family's table. Uh, you know, it's, it is this radical second great awakening Methodist. Oh, totally. And I found that the King Benjamin speech is what you're kind of referring to. Uh, one year before Joseph Smith uh, gets the play, or, yeah, 1826, in Palmyra, there was a big revival there, and a guy named Bishop McKendry came in, and he was looked upon as a sainted man, and the whole Ontario district came to hear him. He was feeble. He was, uh, and he talked about uh, the whole plan of salvation and everybody on the grounds adjoined except children. This is a dead ringer for, for there, there's even one of the preachers on the stand named Benjamin, and they're, they have their tents in a horseshoe just like Benjamin did, and on and on the parallels go. He's feeble, but he's, you know, uh, and then after the, after the speech, they're assigned to the stations of the preachers, and that's the very word that's used in the Book of Mormon. Uh, when when these uh, missionaries Aaron and Ammon and so forth later go, it it just it's really filled with Methodist. Uh, but but that was one of the things that influenced me to take a serious look at the Book of Mormon is these eleven preachers between the, uh, uh, Jacob Enos and up through Alma 42, and and it was the language, the the King James usage, the frontier metaphors, they're, they're just all there. This is not an ancient record. This is a 19th century influence and a major influence at that. One of the first critics 
in writing of Joseph Smith was Alexander Campbell. Mm. Uh, Sidney Rigdon had been a Campbellite uh, pastor and led his congregation that had split from the Campbellites into the Mormon yes. Church. At, mm -hmm. I think I've heard something like 3,500 of the first Mormons were out of the Campbellite, not, not the first. Well, the New York Mormons, almost all of them were in the treasure digging. Okay. But once you go to Ohio, yes, Isaac Morley, Rigdon, the Pratts, Partridge, they are definitely coming out of the Campbellite uh, influence. Alexander Campbell said that Joseph Smith in basically one fell swoop had answered all the questions of the day on baptism and church yep. government and paid clergy and all these, yep. these other things. And it, I mean, it just sticks out like a sore thumb that it's, it's a very contemporary thing, answering the modern questions, using the modern language, I mean, and, and using language that uh, you pointed out that the 1769 King James had some errors. And they trans and they're right in the Book of Mormon. This is a, this is a, you know, they fluff it off, but it's it's a serious concern. I want to say one other thing. Um, so anyway, the the eleven preachers when I was working at BYU, um, as a part time, uh, considered half faculty and half working on the PhD. That's what jumped out at me on the Book of Mormon, and it was something new to me. The other thing that jumped out at me when I started looking at the four foundational visions, and that represents the last four chapters of the book, is that uh, it wasn't just one of the four. And the four are the, the eight and three witnesses, especially the eight, and then the angel gold plate story, and then the priesthood restoration in the first vision. What jumped out at me there after I looked at all the different versions is that uh, they became more and more impressive, unique, physical, uh, yes, miraculous. They, they follow that pattern. Not, not one of them, but all four. And I was ready to excuse, uh, you know, if there's only one of them that has this kind of embellishment development, but to find all four. And the priesthood restoration and the first vision, uh, impressive accounts, the miraculous ones especially, came after Joseph Smith had a serious confrontation with his own leadership and they wanted to know, and then he came out with these more miraculous versions. So that was another impetus for the book. Well, before we get too far on that, let's go ahead and take our first call. We have with us Dale from West Valley. Dale, good to have you with us. Thank you. Um, my question is, is very simple. It sounds to me like from what I've been hearing that what is actually being stated is, is it possible that Joseph Smith plagiarized the Book of Mormon? Uh, Thank you for your call. Yes, I, I, I think to sum it up in a sentence, you could say that the Book of Mormon is essentially a ripoff of 19th century Christianity. The, the the book that you mention uh, prominently in, in here is uh, Ethan Smith's view of the Hebrews. Um, I've heard some people, I think, go too far in trying to say that it's a copy of that. But I think that you do a good job in terms of qualifying that shows that long before anyone ever heard of the Book of Mormon, people were speculating that the mm -hmm. American Indians were actually Jews. and Ethan Smith, who was the Congregationalist pastor of the Pratts, right? Uh, Elder uh, Cowdery. Cowdery. I, time I said it, I knew I said it right. Up in Vermont. <laughs> right. Cowdery's uh, were members of Ethan Smith's uh, congregation. Oliver Cowdery, uh, one of the three witnesses uh, yes. to the Book of Mormon. Uh, his pastor writes this book in 1825? 23 in the 23. second edition in 25, and it just okay. swept through New York. It was very popular. It was discussed at the drugstore, that kind of thing. In fact, B.H. Roberts, who was an LDS general authority, First Quorum of 70, said that uh, there is a great probability that Smith said uh, encountered this book. And, uh, and Again, I don't think Joseph's getting too much of the content from that, but maybe the storyline, that's what B.H. Uh, Roberts suggested. Uh, for those who don't know about Ethan Smith's uh, 
book, the outline basically says the following, that a group of Israelites, a colony of Israelites in about 600 B.C., as I recall, might be off a little bit there, but about 600 B.C., uh, came, I think, from, I was thinking Rome, but they were Israelites, and they had a tough ocean cro crossing. They came to the Americas, and then they soon broke into two factions, a civilized and an uncivilized fa faction, and they had many long wars, and uh, there's a Christ figure in there throughout the book, and then in the end, the uncivilized uh, group completely annihilates the, the civilized group. Well, that sounds a lot like the storyline of the Book of Mormon if you had to shorten it up. Uh, it, but, the, but Ethan Smith's view of the Hebrew is not an early draft of the Book of Mormon. And I, I personally don't believe Spalding had much or Rigdon had much to do with the Book of Mormon. I don't think you can make that case stick. All the historians I know don't give it much credit. Uh, the evidence would point that they met Rigdon met Smith after the Book of Mormon is published, not before. Although there's some there's some reminiscences reminiscences to that. My research would uh, reject that. And the people who try to speculate that there was actually this um, lost manuscripts of uh, of Solomon Spalding, you would reject that as well. Yeah, and I don't know uh, any historians who put much credence in that idea. Okay, we're gonna go to Matthew in Salt Lake. Matthew, good to have you with us. Hi, I've got a I've got a question uh, that that maybe you or uh, Mr. Palmer could uh, address. Um, I don't know if you two saw it, but a couple of nights ago, on uh, one of the local television stations here on the on the ten o'clock news, uh, they did an interview with uh, one of the uh, one of the general actually one of the uh, quorum of the twelve, and uh, it was uh, Ballard. And uh, three or four times in that uh, interview, it was a five minute piece or whatever. I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, that he said it three or four times. I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he I mean, he really wanted to be sure that, that no one missed that. And I was just wondering, is he, is he, does he believe this? Uh, is he, uh, is he uh, sincere in, in, in believing that? And uh, what, what is your take on, on somebody that uh, is so forthright in, uh, in making such a statement. Thank you. Thank you. In your experience, uh, do many people, even in leadership in the LDS Church, really know much about the history? No, I don't think so. Uh, they know our best historians are disturbed, but I don't think they look beneath the veneer. I think that's probably is about about it. They certainly are learning about it because a lot of people are telling their bishops and stake presidents. I assume that filters up. I did not see the interview with Elder Ballard. Uh, I was in Africa, and uh, but my my uh, strong sense is that they they truly believe in what they're saying. They do. I don't know that they meet the criteria of apostles. If you go to Acts one. Uh, when Judas loses his bishopric, it says, uh, and they were going to replace him, Peter outlines the criteria for who can replace him, and he mm -hmm. simply says they have to have witnessed the baptism of John, they had to witness the ministry of Jesus, the two or three year ministry, they had to have witnessed the, the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And they came up with two individuals who had met that criteria. Uh, it's easy for me to see how you really probably couldn't have apostles on the earth very long because who could meet all those qualifications? And then once they had these two men, uh, is it Matthias and who's the other one? Search of the Bee, Bar uh -huh. Barnabas or Bar Barabbas or something? Uh -huh. something I mean, like I'm, this is the fun of live TV. I, I'm drawing a complete blank. I, yeah. I remember it's Matthias, but... He's the one that was chosen. <laughs> right. But at that point, they simply chose him by what we would call flipping quarters or drawing Cast, straws, drawing lots is what they call it. The most important part of that was that he met the criteria. So, uh, you know, there's lots of apostles. I, I think there's over a hundred who are claiming to be apostles. The, the Strangites 
claim to have 12 apostles. This, this group down in Manti has 12. The RLDS 12 has 12. The LDS has 12. The, uh, uh, it, Church it, of Christ Temple Lot. I, I met one of their yeah, apostles. Yeah, I, I met them too. And so you start, well, there, there's, there's lots of people claiming that they're apostles, but they don't meet the historic uh, qualifications as outlined by Peter in Acts 1. And I think that's important. But I, I, I think they would say today, and they may have changed this a little bit, they're not so much special witnesses of Christ, but they're special witnesses to the name of Christ. That's a recent um, emphasis that, that I've heard about. Now, but, but I think he's sincere. He believes it. I've talked to our LDS apostles. They believe it. The Church of Christ lot back in Independence. He believes it. Yeah, they invest a lot of their, their time and everything else. If you'd like to join in the conversation, our phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. We have with us Grant Palmer, the author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Now, it's hard to speculate about people's motivations. Uh, we can't read people's hearts. You believe that Joseph Smith could have written the Book of Mormon and these other th things. Why, if you had to speculate from what you've seen? I mean, um, do, you, do you think he was doing it as a fraud, as a, as a, as a swindler? Do you think he was uh, self-deceived? I mean, obviously, if you can't do it for someone who's living, it's even harder to try to do it for someone who's dead, but what well, in, I, what I think he wrote the book just with exactly why, what he said in the in the introduction pages to bring people to Christ. I think he was sincere in that. I think, for example, he went to, to New York in, in uh, 1832 and he writes a letter back to Emma and he is really, really distressed. He says, all I see, every countenance has wickedness in it. This, New York City has, uh, what, 350,000 people in, uh, in, in 1832. And he says, I, I walked the streets and I was just, boy, they all deserve to, you know, to to go to hell. I mean, he's really exercised until he he can no longer stay out on the streets, and he comes back to his uh, apartment and and stays there. He is he's really worried about uh, people not accepting Christ. And in 1800, only seven percent of uh, Americans belong to a church. So I think he's 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 motivated there. I, I see elements of sincerity and fraud in Joseph Smith when. When he goes up to get those plates in 1827 on, on the equinox, he, I think he had to make a decision. Uh, okay, it begins. Do I say I get, I get these plates and they're for real or not? Uh, I don't, I, I think B.H. Roberts was probably right about that, that the plates were psychological with Joseph Smith. They weren't real plates. Although he goes to the effort to put them in a, uh, a pillowcase or what have you, and uh, I think he did that to enhance belief. But the very fact that all these ancient Nephites took all that time to uh, to uh, uh, do this writing on hard, difficult writing, and yet he doesn't use the material is 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 a real question mark. Yeah, the one of the things that's often said is that you know Martin Harris left the church and Oliver Cowdery, but but they never, they never uh, took back their testimony. Oh, that's a good one, all right. Uh, n you know, uh, a lot of those men, now ha Martin Harris is probably the most strange of all. He was, I think he joined five or six groups before Mormonism and seven or eight after, including seances. He mm -hmm. got into seances, sent to Brigham Young. Look, I've seen Elias. I've seen Moses. <laughs> Uh, when Gladden Bishop, and was it 1845, <laughs> he's, he's going to have witnesses to his plates. In fact, he claims to get plates, and his daughter and Harris are going to be the witnesses. And B Bishop claims to have not only the artifacts that Joseph had, but he's got the small and large crown of Lehi. And, and guess who his witness is going to be? Martin Harris. Harris is like a spiritual gypsy. He just bounces around and he never denies anything, whether he's in the seances, whether he's joined the shaker. 
He never denies any of these things. And, and you see, these men are into second sight, and the Whitmers and Page and Cowdery, they're all related. Uh, they're all into this kind of uh, second sight, or the, the scriptural phrase for this is uh, in the eyes of our understanding. And so they're, they're seeing lots of stuff. They're, they're not seeing it. They're actually perceiving it. But LDS today th think that they're seeing it, but I think it's perceiving it. Uh, but but they they don't really deny much of anything. And when James Strang comes along, he says, "Well, Joseph appointed me, and here is, a, and I was told to get uh, more of the plates of the of Laban, you know, the Laban mm -hmm. character in the Book of Mormon, and he makes up a set of plates, and and four individuals dig them up." So they sign their testimony, these are ancient plates, and so forth. And then another seven witness another set of plates. None of those eleven, Joseph Smith had eleven. Strang has eleven witnesses, four and seven. Joseph has three, three and eight. eight. And they never, none of them ever deny their testimony, ever. And so this idea that they never deny their testimony is, is not as impressive as it might sound. And Strang's witnesses included some pretty notable names, didn't it? Uh, two of them, it had been Mormon, I know, <coughs> previously. And, of course, the whole Smith family buys in through revelation that Strang is the successor. William Smith, who's been an apostle of the LDS Church, he says, uh, God told me that Strang has the mantle, and he, you know, they are all ready to go, all ready to join. And they haven't even met the man. That's and, how and easily they're influenced. Emma's ready to join. Emma's. The only one that didn't was Mary Fielding, a Hiram's widow. Okay. Let's take a few more phone calls before we run out of time. We have uh, Galen from Salt Lake. Galen, good to have you with us. Hey, it's good to listen to your program. This is very interesting. I'd like to ask Mr. Palmer, uh, is he an evangelical Christian? If so, is Christianity the basic true religion? If so, what, uh, what are the basic steps to be a Christian? It's obvious to me that he probably doesn't believe in Mormonism as a true Christian religion, so can he address to get his own ideas of, about what a Christian is and what he believes now? Thanks. Okay. Um, I wrote my first book to point out the problems of which I, serious foundational problems of the church, but I didn't want to leave it at that, so I wrote a second book called The Incomparable Jesus, and that's where I, I, I think the only honorable thing is to go in that direction, more Christ-centeredness all across the board in the Mormon experience. Um, I think we're coming back next week, and I'm going to talk more about that book, and I'll probably, uh, I, I'll be talking more about an answer to the question that, is, that was just been raised, but uh, we'll take a look of what, it, what, it, what constitutes being a Christian, and, and do a comparison between the Mormon Jesus and the uh, New Testament Jesus. I, I see a number of differences in personality, behavior, attitude, and even doctrinal emphasis, and uh, we'll get into that next week. Okay. We have with us Randy from Colville. Randy, good to have you with us. Yeah, I'm here. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, are you? Uh, yeah, hi there. This is Randy from Colville, and uh, I just wanted to call and ask. I've, I've kind of developed a little friendship with the uh, bishop at the seminary across from the high school here, and I kind of complained about why the church is always locked. Um, uh, he told me that's because everybody is appointed and they are not compensated. I wanted you to touch on that subject. Okay. I've uh, never been asked that before. Uh, um, I don't know how to really answer that except uh, uh, Usually in these church buildings, there's two or three wards in a building, so somebody is usually around there. If you look on the signs it's of the church, it says welcome, but they never give the hours of when the services are, which always seemed a little strange to me. I've, I've had people tell me that if they went to, uh, they wanted to go in and pray, that was always locked up. 
Um, I, I, I don't know what answer they would give as to why the building's always locked, but uh, it's true to say they are often locked. Quick question. This is a little bit of a sore subject for me because I've been accused of it for 13 years now. <laughs> uh, you worked full-time for the LDS Church for 34 years. Yes. And they paid you a salary. They did. I'm curious if within the church education system you hear the same kinds of accusations against pastors working full time for other churches being uh, somehow greed motivated if they're trying to feed their families as well? Or is that something that's just Well, that's a common misperception. I don't know any uh, pastors that are getting rich off their ministry. and I there, are few, there are some, actually. Are, I well, I guess if you go <laughs> into Texas and <laughs> Joel Austin has, you know, these huge crowds. And, uh, not many Orthodox Presbyterian I don't know any who are getting rich here in Utah, and <laughs> no. I'm certainly not getting rich off of book sales, and, and my book has been the leading seller at, uh, from Signature Books since 2002, and I, I don't make that much money off it. I think I got a, a royalty check for six months the other day. It was 288 bucks or something. I mean, that's not exactly a lot of money. You gonna spend that all in one place? Or? I gave it to my wife and it was an <laughs> account. We put it in our account. I guess okay. that's what's for. In the in the few minutes we have left, um, I'd like to go back to to the eyes of our understanding. Oh. Uh, most people aren't aware of the fact that there were all these visions in the Kirtland Temple. Can you touch on those for just a couple of minutes? I once talked to one of our historians, T. Edgar Lyon, who I had a lot of respect for. He was over the Nauvoo Restoration Project. Um, I asked him that question. He says, well, uh, if you fast for two or three days and then drink beer on an empty stomach, you're going to see things. And that was, he was serious about that. I, I don't know about that, but they're in a culture that thinks a little differently than we do. Uh, we're empirical people. And if you read section 110, the very first verse says, and the eyes of our understanding were open. That means they're seeing stuff in their mind. And when Moses and Christ and, and Elijah and uh, Elias, which are the same person, when they see them, uh, there are three veils and Joseph and Rigdon or Cowdery sees them. I think what they're doing is perceiving them. They're not seeing them as you and I see one another. The 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants is the same way. We saw Jesus by the eyes of our understanding. Or as participants said in the Kirtland Temple experiences, uh, we saw convoy after convoy of angels all by the eyes of our understanding. That, that was known as second sight in a secular phrase. And the witnesses are seen inside Camorra. There's all kinds of uh, experiences where they see inside this hill, and it's been thoroughly studied, and there's no lacuna in that hill. And they, uh, uh, they're seeing tables and plates and swords sheathed and unsheathed, and uh, they take the plates back, and the hill opens up. I mean, this is a different uh, mindset than we're used to. But it's become... Uh, it's become typically interpreted that when the three witnesses or the eight witnesses uh, see the angel or s handle the plates, that they're actually physically handling them. This is, if you read their individual testimonies, this is not what they're saying. In fact, the eight witnesses hesita hesitated to sign the document, in the what is now in the front of the Book of Mormon. And Joseph had to persuade them to sign it. I think the reason is because the statement sounds quite physical, and I don't think they're seeing it physically. But he does persuade them, and they do sign. But this is all about uh, second sight, the eyes of our understanding, the spiritual eye, the eye of faith. These are all the same phrases. See, it, see things in the mind. Uh, Joseph is hired as a treasure digger because he can see things in his mind. Quick question, in about a minute, if you could touch on how this corresponds to Martin Harris's testimony up in Idaho. What does he say there? He said quite um, a bit. Well, in terms of his vision of the plates. Oh, he said he saw it with his spiritual eyes. We have three or four 
comments to that. But all of his statements are saying the same thing. He says he bounced them on his knee once when they were on a cloth. But he even sees uh, the plates under the cloth with his spiritual eyes. This is before he's appointed to be one of the three witnesses. And by the way, the three and eight witnesses all saw the plates in a vision before they are selected to be uh, witnesses of the gold plates. So Joseph already has some pretty ready believers, uh, Oliver Cowdery included. He says he saw the plates in a vision uh, when he was in the Smith house. And they invited him over. He was a school teacher there in the neighborhood. Uh, so you, so it's predicted in the Book of Mormon that three and eight will see it, but, but they've already seen him. This is not a, a startling prophecy for Joseph Smith to put in the book because the men have already seen them. In their mind, they see Moroni on a road. They see uh, with the plates at a backpack. They see uh, hanging around the Whitmer farms. Uh, this, it's very, very, uh, you, have to, you cannot understand What's going on if you don't understand this spiritual eye, second sight, the eyes of our understanding? It's not quite as impressive as we've been telling it. Well, I want to thank you again for being with us uh, and uh, look forward to having you back next week. It's been a great pleasure to have you. Uh, it is our plan to have Mr. Palmer back with us next week uh, and we're going to be talking more about uh, his experiences and uh, how truth matches up with faith in these matters. The show is sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church. We are a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South here in the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, we have a sister congregation, Berean Presbyterian that meets in Ogden at 3350 Harrison Boulevard at 9 a.m. And we also have a Bible study in Utah County and one we're trying to get started up in Heber. If you would like more information on us, you can go to our website, www.christpres.net, or you can give us a phone call at 801-969-7948. We are a church that believes that the Bible is God's inerrant, infallible word that we are sinners saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Till next week, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings and hope to see you again soon. Good night. Yeah.